Should be any second now. There we go. I think okay. Well, how you doing? Hello, everybody. Stargazers, astrophysicists are us here. It's a weekly Monday morning, 11 o'clock a.m. vlog podcast with the South Coast's longtime astrophysics and telescope club, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. We call it the SBAU Astro Hour. Find out all about us on sbau.org. It's our 129th program. Do the math. That's over two and a half years. Pretty much straight. Again, viewable on YouTube as we meet and talk about the cosmos. I'm your host, Ron Heron, from the club's board, and we'll introduce you to the president and the outreach commander in a minute here. You can comment or ask questions during the program. One of our guys, Tim Crawford, does. Uh, better yet, join us. We're getting some new members. We're having some incredible full houses almost, as far as I'm concerned, at Fleischmann Auditorium, beautiful museum of natural history. First Friday of every month. Just had a grand talk from one of uh, our president's old friends, Dr. Peter Love, on the James Webb Telescope. We're going to talk about this uh, hour, this SBAU Astro Hour. Check on the Summer Triangle, the moon's final quarter coming up. Uh, several of the planets, most of them, are going to focus on, and at least one strange off-kilter sign on the zodiac called Ophiuchus. I love saying that. I feel like I'm talking dirty in ancient uh, <laughs> Greek. Uh, somebody's about to join us. I think it's Tom. Well, we'll introduce you. Yeah, there he is. We're also going to talk about a couple of comets passing us out of many, not one, but two. There's another large asteroid to chat about. It's called 15 Eumonia, which was also the name of my first wife. Some star stuff. <laughs> Luna is visiting the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades. They just gather together up there in the sky. It's amazing. Certain class of stars where there probably would not be much chance of planetary life. We're going to try to get to that this hour. Meanwhile, let's meet the president. Long time. How many years now, Jerry Wilson? Six, seven? Hi, Jerry. Um, I was vice president through 2016, so I became president in 2017. Okay. And uh, married to Pat Forgey and got to see his house out there and his little square building in the back there, a, a little uh, astronomy hut, if you will. Actually, I didn't get to, during your birthday, I didn't get to go through that, but it well, was open. come over sometime. I would love to. Outreach guy, Chuck McPartland, whose wife is Pat. And she's the merchandise manager, and he's got outreach he's going to tell us about here in a minute. And he's also serving with his wife as our incredible secretary till we get Tessa Flanagan back. Tom Winnemore is on Morning. screen, former Westmont College science instructor, had a lab out there, editor of our Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit newsletter. And his wife is Maureen. And the man smells of sourdough bread wherever he goes, but that's why they invite him to parties. Four of us, I guess. No Bruce Murdoch yet. But he was at the party, and we missed you at the big meeting, Tom. But uh, you were there for the uh, Gladwin grand opening of the two new. Yeah, it was just overflowing with people. And, oh, God, I guess so. Uh, I didn't want to stand with this new hip. So. Did you have to stand, or did you get a couple of chairs? Oh, no, no, there was no way. <laughs> oh, so you left. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was telling the guys I hated to have to save my two chairs for somebody I promised a seat, and there's only. Yeah, but you were sitting in both of them simultaneously. Well, I was waiting for a friend <laughs> of mine, and he showed up right at 7 when we began the incredible program in Gladwin Planetarium. Yeah. What well, we're members, you know, Maureen and I, and so we've been longtime members of the museum. So we'll go to one of Chuck's uh, Sunday gigs. How's that, Chuck? All, All right, that's the deal. All right. right. One. Why don't we uh, go there before we go to the cartoons, Chuck? What's coming up immediately within the next couple of weeks before you go to Ireland? Oh, for, for outreach? Yeah, for outreach. Uh, this week's a little quiet. There's Thursday at Bacara, Friday at Refugio State Beach, and then Saturday is the second Saturday. That's at the Museum of Natural History. And you don't take that black cat with you, right? Nope. <laughs> but, but now I, I heard or read that you were out 200 days a year. That's more than half the year. That's more than half the week. Is that possible? Yeah, well, sometimes we do two events a day for various, you know, when we do schools and stuff. Is that right? And you never yeah. get tired of it. I mean, oh, unless sometimes. you get sick. <laughs> <laughs> you ever dropped the uh, five pound meteorite on your uh, foot and made it walk like a duck? <laughs> no, but uh, I've had people almost do it. And I had actually a big scare once when I gave it to a junior high kid and said, don't drop this on your toe. And he said, OK. And he threw it at his friend's foot. 
<laughs> yeah. So he left like a three quarter inch ding in their library hardwood floor. He's the kind wow. of kid they don't want in the audience of those big singers that get hit yeah. these days. Maybe even following that. We got silly science cartoons who uh, President Jerry forwards to all of us. And uh, there's a big bunch of them here. Let's go to the silly screen and get into a levity laughing mood. That's the. Um, <laughs> wow. That's your living room, isn't it, Whittemore? No, this is this no. is uh, um, a remote observatory <laughs> where the guy has completely computerized his computer, his telescope. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and we're in the back part of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, scientist tells a great science joke at the conference. Tells the joke. There's uproarious laughter. Continued laughter. <laughs> Round of applause. Warm feelings. He repeats the great science joke at home. Silence. And he has to explain it. More silence. Ah, let's change the subject. Boy, that's typical, isn't it? <laughs> and here we are. Aliens be like, wasn't Nicholas, Nikola Tesla supposed to stop this? Yeah, but they didn't listen. That's a little more scary than it is funny. <laughs> they're having a good laugh by looking down on us. One panel guide to astrobiology. Stick figures looking in the old ancient telescopes where you actually had to do that inside a big uh, observatory. Nope. No kitty cats on that one either. Mark it off. That's what they're looking for. Some people think it's methane gas. Oh, here this guy in the heat wave. And uh, the sun is telling him, no, it's not me. It's you guys down there. Boy, that's the truth, ain't it? By telling that to some politics. Oh, here's my old arch nemesis. Helped create the name the Baron. What a beautiful night, says Snoopy. He's out with his tent. And he's dressed for full regalia flying his plane. The moon is full. He sits on the top. There must be a billion stars in the sky. And doggone, I'm going to lie down. It's a perfect <laughs> night to get a star tan. There it is. Sounds like something Carl Sagan would have said. Now, this looks like uh, uh, that Irish actor Richard Harris, but it could be. Three conspiracy theorists walk into a bar, and you know, you just can't tell me that's just a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's technically funny, but it is. Why Now, this is one you're going to need to explain, Jerry. Why does Zoom have offices? Why do they, or should they not? See the building up here? It has Zoom on it. This is the Zoom office building. Right? You think they'd run everything by Zoom? <laughs> okay. Well, it's better than a big flashing X. <laughs> yeah. None of you guys are little bird tweeters, are you? I love that photo. Okay. I'm hoping Zuckerberg beats the crap out of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's plummeting. There's a lot of stuff going on, gentlemen. Well, we don't know where Bruce Murdoch is, but by any chance, is Tim Crawford on board watching on YouTube and commenting? He's uh, he texted me that he's on. Yeah. OK, we're going to start with, I guess, your uh, episode 129 Ophiuchus talking points. One of your favorite right. favorite non signs of the Zodiac. Ah, Here we go to the sky, the night Oops. sky. 13th sign of the Zodiac and the 11th largest constellation. Big, but stars are faint. Yeah. OK, here we this go. Is these faint little lines, you may not be able to see them on here, but they are the border lines of the constellations real estate. Mm -hmm. The red lines connect stars. There's many different ways to connect it. Um, but That's this a is really the horrible way actually there, isn't it? Yeah, I agree <laughs> it doesn't with that. look like his shoulders and his arm and his yeah. neck and all. Okay, so it's a him. I'm sorry, but what <laughs> does it become if you put the actual configured... Animal. Well, there is no actual figure. It's, you know, there's, um, it's just what, it's the way the human brain picks out patterns of things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I've, I've so. seen all those snakes and the hunter and everything on the screen. So Ophiuk, if it's, if it's one of the 88. Yeah, yeah. it's up be... there. It represents Asclepius. He's supposed to be mm -hmm. mythical Greek physician that they thought snakes were immortal because they shed their skins and started a new life type thing. And the story was he figured out how the snakes were immortal and he was making people immortal and it ticked off the gods. So they put him up there holding his snake. <laughs> and it wants to be part of the 12 Zodiac and it just can't be. Mm -hmm. it's number 13. Okay. What else? So anyway, this is, this is the constellation Ophiuchus. Mm -hmm. It is the 13th sign of the Zodiac. <laughs> if, if you think you're a Sagittarius, you're probably an Ophiuchide. <clears throat> Terrible condition oh. to be in. 
Yeah, the sky does shift over time, slowly. Hmm. There's two two very interesting uh, objects here. Of course, this is a very rich region of the Milky Way. This is the center of our galaxy down here. And this is just a little off the Milky Way, a couple of globular star clusters. Now, these globular star clusters go around in big circular orbits around the Milky Way. They don't follow the plane of the Milky Way. They no. exist outside of the disk. And we have two nice examples here, M10 and M12. M, of course, stands for Messier. The right. French guy, his first name was Charles. Mm -hmm. This is M10, I think, or M12. This is M12. Uh -huh. Quite a cluster. Quite Let a... me know. This is, this is M10. And those Sometimes. individual stars are just, what, uh, light weeks away from each other, probably, right? Probably. Yeah. There's some red giants in here, but most of these are very hot white stars, very old stars. Okay, no possibility uh, of a supermassive, you know what? Not supermassive, but some globular clusters do have black holes. Yeah. Which is nothing more than all those stars that are so damn close together that over the years they sucked up each other and disappeared no they make they make something called blue stragglers which really? is where they they gain a lot of mass and they get really hot but they didn't get it there by being big to begin with okay sounds like a talking this point is, to the future this is m12 which is a distinctly looser packing of stars so if you're wow. in the region and you have a good telescope to look at it and it doesn't these are bright objects relative to the other stuff up there so you don't need a very big telescope to look at, to show the, the diffuseness of it and a few outlying stars. <clears throat> to resolve cores like this, you do need bigger telescopes. But, but this is a I, good... I was just going to mention, Jerry, uh, Saturday night we, we had some dinner guests over. So I pulled out the 85 millimeter um, and pulled in just wonderful shots of 7, 6, and 22 you know, M7, you know, uh, Ptolemy's M6 butterfly. And then uh, 22 is one of my favorite globulars. So we're, we're a little bit shy of where you're looking right now. We're down a little further south. And out where you live, Tom, it's nice and dark. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, M13, I can almost see uh, in the backyard naked eye in the summertime. When it goes to the top of the sky. Isn't and it in great Kishima, to go out there and isn't it a great was, not to, to not to freeze your garbanzos off midsummer like this no oh no 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 it's 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 pretty it's pretty nice the skies here are really good saturday was really nice except uh saturn we i got saturn for the folks and it looked like a dancing fireball <laughs> really <laughs> at kachuma on saturday uh it's it's again it's kind of uh in in serpents caught i think uh -huh. uh, is uh, the eagle nebula Mm -hmm. And we cranked the Malin cam on that, and we were seeing the pillars of creation. So it was a oh, nice. That's nice. That's nice. Just yeah. like the web sees them. No, not quite in that detail, but we could see them. <laughs> yeah, I'd have a lot of a, a hard time seeing that in an eighty-five millimeter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pillars of creation look like a big hand in a way. Yeah, of, of fingers. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. President, where are we now? Which M is this? This is, um, which one is this? This is M12, mm -hmm. and you need a bigger scope to resolve the core, but this is such a loose uh, globular cluster that uh, this even this photograph shows it um, resolved. Of course, this is a bigger telescope, but you can see a number of blue stars in here, probably blue stragglers amid all the white stars. These stars that are slightly yellow are just unsaturated, but they're still uh, red giants in this conglomeration it's a nice thing to look at would it be possible gentlemen to compare the star clusters in our uh, galaxy like many galaxies in which case this looks like an elliptical do they ever form kind of a pinwheel like you know like this do they ever have arms you mean yeah do they ever go on a i assume all those stars are orbiting each other pretty much aren't they going around in a big ball they're they're kind of in a chaotic orbit so any any features you see that look like arms, like M13 has some things that look like arms coming out. Yes. They're just kind of randomly happen. They're not, 
uh, traffic jam structures like you see in, mm -hmm. in a spiral galaxy. Yeah, also LeBron M22, one of my favorites. Again, it's, it's in Sagittarius. Uh, Steve O'Meara pointed out one time that it has kind of like a black stripe going through it. Have you ever seen that, Chuck? No, but uh, M4 uh -huh. ha has a bar in it, uh, bar sort of feature in it. And so it's called the cat's eye. It looks like a vertical pupil. Okay. Wow. Steve O'Meara could pull that out with his eyeballs. <laughs> you know the m22 uh little uh -huh. straight through a dark strike but now i was told once that more than half the sky's stars more than half of them are binaries at least or trinaries is that true of all these little white dots that we're looking at is are most of them little orbiting binaries or trinaries or quarks? i think that would be improbable they yeah. are so close together they're gonna change partners it's sort of like a high school sock hop you know you you just change partners <laughs> regularly. But you would think the law of averages sooner or later would see two of them collide. You know, That's where you get the blue stragglers that, yeah. that were just yeah. mentioned. Is yeah, that what the, that means? These, see these yeah. blue stars? Those are a couple of white stars that smashed together and formed a new star. Really? And and, and as often as not, they do the little spinning dance for out, days and days and weeks until they finally just become a blur and whoops, we're together. No yeah. explosion. Yeah. Yeah, you have to remember. I don't, I don't know the probability of that. So, Ron, you have they to do regularly the... expel members. They do gradually evaporate. Yeah, but it's weird when they evaporate, they get denser. Uh, they they shoot a star out, but the it, it's usually an interaction between three, and the two that are left end up closer together. Tom, what more you were saying? Oh, I just said you have to remember that you know the stars in these kinds of clusters are really, really old. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, 10 billion years old. I mean, they're very, very old. Okay. So they've been around for a long time together. Well, when Chuck says evaporate, I suddenly think of Stephen Hawking talking about the formality, the complete uh, black, black hole is gone forever and never come back. And yet he's talking about evaporation, like some of it's mm -hmm. going away anyway. <laughs> but mm -hmm. you're applying it to stars. One of yeah, well, I, that, that, in the, with the black holes, that's a quantum effect. But here it's a, a dynamical effect. Oh, yeah. classical classical that, physics sure. effect. <laughs> Everything you see in the sky is in sort of uh, dynamic balance. I forget the exact term for that. But this star cluster has mutual gravitation. The, the center of this acts like a point source to things out here. And they're in some kind of an orbit around this, which holds the cluster together. But over time, different members escape. And the, the 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 mass of the part holding everything together uh, decreases, and as it decreases, these things are also like the the galaxy or this cluster here is orbiting around the center of our Milky Way, and each star you see here is in sort of or trying to be in its own independent orbit, but these things uh, hold it together through. Um, but it's a tidal interaction type of thing. As the core gets weaker the the orbit around the galaxy cluster becomes more dominant. And there is one star cluster that very dramatically shows this. It's lost so many stars that the, the gravitational attraction holding it together is weak enough that in its trailing direction, it has a stream of stars going out this way that have given up and they're now being tidally disrupted. And in the other direction, there's a stream of stars going out the other side. So it is actively dumping stars because of its tidal uh, interaction with the core of our galaxy. But to the naked eye, do any of these star clusters look like a single bright star in the heavens? They, they all do to your naked eye. Well, oh, like a fuzzy patch, not like yeah. a bright star, though. Right, right. Okay. Depends what your vision is. Yeah. <laughs> what I read over the weekend uh, somewhere was that all the stars that are like our sun are barely visible up there. Only the big right. monsters. Yeah. And things yeah. Like this. Actually, I pointed that out to our guests on Saturday. We're looking at uh, M7. It's one of my favorites, Ptolemy's Cluster. It's near the Stinger stars in uh, Scorpius. And it's about 800 light years away, just roughly. And I said, if you put our sun there, you couldn't see it with my little telescope. Is you that right? Couldn't... Yeah. <laughs> but it's not a red dwarf we're orbiting. It's a pretty good size, you know, stellar system. What... Here's a triangle, right? Mm -hmm. The summer triangle. Now that we <laughs> showed this back in June, um, but it's the same today in August. 
It hasn't changed. It's got the bright stars. What is that? Vega, Deneb, and uh, Altair oh. down here. So um, the reason it's here is that there's an article in Astronomy Magazine that picks out three uh, variable stars that are very interesting. One in each of the constellations that is that has one of the triangle stars in it. So in Aquila, which is down here, we have our Aquila, a red giant with a 270 day period. And wow. that is this is a local finder chart for that. Well, that's not a triangle. No, this is uh, no, this no, the triangle is now too big. This is Altair down here, and the variable is our Archila right here, halfway between Xi and what is that? Delta? Omicron? Yeah. Looks like Delta. Well, oh yeah. really. And then R tells me that you know, the fact that's R, that variable star is R, tells me it's the first one they cataloged in Aquila. Okay. Hmm. Because it goes R S T U V. That's how they start, you know, uh, numbering these things. So at the brightest, you can see R with your naked eye, but at the dim, you have to use a telescope to see it or a pair of binoculars. It's not that faint. And did we talk about Mira stars? What that means? Myra, Myra, Myra type. type variables. Yeah. Okay. Those it's are the carbon carbon carbon. We'll we'll get to that in just a minute. This is the other triangle star, Vega, and the star down here, Beta, in this little trapezoid that represents a uh, lyre. Mm -hmm. um, that is Sheliac, and it is an algo um, eclipsing binary algo type. Huh. And that's one where they're so close together that one is actually siphoning material off the other. Well, are we looking at an asterism there? Or is that? Well, that's the constellation Lyra the Harp. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This, this asterism here has a name. It's the constellation, as, as Chuck points out. You there. might look at different parts of this and see different asterisms that remind you of things. Because your mind will put these together in different patterns of triangles and circles and arcs and stuff. And each one of them is an asterism to you. So but you got more is, asterisms up there than constellations, more than 88? It's oh, yeah. Littered with them all over the sky. Mm -hmm. And when uh, you find one that's so distinct, you'll think you'll never forget it. It's going to be something that you use as a signpost, and then you can never find it again. <laughs> so that's my experience. And but Ron, the, 57 is the uh, the famous ring nebula. Yeah. Oh, is that right? We, we always show that at star parties. <laughs> Yes. Ring nebula. It's an easy, yeah, it's an easy object, but it requires um, magnification to see that it's not a flat star. Mm -hmm. So there's Volpecula and there's Hercules. H-E-R at the upper right. What is that? That's, Hero That's Hercules. See, it Hercules. Connects, connects down here. Gotcha. Because this, this is the borderline for that constellation. This is one of the smaller constellations. Yep. Looks like the Canadian province of Saskatchewan. <laughs> Let's, we're in the sky here, everybody. Vega, Denim. Now, this is Chi Sigma or Chi Cygnus. And okay. that is right here, C H I. Mm -hmm. I didn't remember how to get the keyboard to show the Greek symbol for Chi. <clears throat> so, although it just came to me right now. So, that is a, a Myra type variable, uh, it's a carbon star. So very red. A 400 day cycle, and it cycles yeah. between third magnitude and 14th magnitude. So it goes very, very faint. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and those carbon stars, Ron, have real long cycle times, you know, upwards of a year, you know. So like we can't really see red dwarfs without high powered telescopes. So red giants, we can see they're part of the sky, right? Yeah. You said red a second ago, Chuck, and I was curious yeah. what kind of red. Well, it's a carbon star. So um, Antares, Betelgeuse, they're carbon stars, plus also some smaller stars are. It just means it has carbon soot, basically, in its atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so it looks very red. 
meaning it's a second or third generation of stars, recycled stars. I forget it's reversed on the order. Yeah. Isn't yeah. It? <laughs> it's population one or two. Three comes first. <laughs> I got to get, get it together on. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're going to look around at some of the planets where they are. This is midnight, um, Wednesday night. But it will be about this position in the east uh, all this week. This And this shows where Neptune is relative to the constellations. If you want to look at it, it will require a telescope. The <clears throat> disk is about two seconds of an arc across, and it's a little bluish disk. Or no, the Uranus is blue. No, this is blue. This Neptune. is blue. Uranus is more greenish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Saturn up there where your cursor is. Yeah, or, right there. Oh, my cursor. <laughs> Yeah, but it's called the ice giant. That means it's mostly H two O. No, it's 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 uh, ammonia and methane, and astronomers call those ices even when they're gases. Is that right? Okay. Well, yeah, just like they call weird. everything other than hydrogen and helium, they call them metals. <laughs> they have their own vernacular. Hmm. And Saturn's looking like punctuation now. It looks like line dot line. We're getting ready for a ring plane crossing in March of yeah. 2025. Yeah, it was <laughs> tough to pull the ring out. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, you know, the, the scene was pretty terrible. And I, I suspect it was at about <laughs> 30. We saw it come over the uh, horizon. Yeah, it was it was decent at Kachuma, but we were later. We were at like at 11 o'clock. Okay. <clears throat> What you were talking about, Chuck, is that when it goes on its side and the ring disappears? Right. Uh, it's yeah. from our point of view, we see it. You know, we're right. It, we're it's like we're right over its equator, and the ring disappears because yeah. it's only it, thirty feet thick. This this ring is slowly lifting up from our point of view until mm -hmm. it cuts right straight across the disc and disappears because it's only thirty five or forty feet thick. I believe our astronomy guy at the museum, uh, uh, John Winkowski, did it on the screen inside our yeah yeah our planetarium. Just amazed everybody. Okay, so this is about eleven o'clock at night um, tomorrow night. Uh, Titan is way out here, uh, so it's the only thing you're going to see here in a small telescope in a light polluted city atmosphere. The rest of these moons, you need a dark side and a slightly bigger telescope. But in this case, Tethers, Tethys is just entering the disk and will cross in the next couple of hours. And Enceladus will follow that through before dawn. So if you want to stay up and look at that, it's pretty cool. So old man Galileo first locked in on Jupiter and its four moons, its Galileans, but a little beyond that would be Saturn and he didn't see any moons just the two ears yep right okay. no Titan in his telescope which he on say mm -hmm. um, he called him on say which means handles and Latin. oh is that right he didn't know what yeah. was a ring ah here's where the moon is right now half and half quarter mm -hmm. this this is um let's see did I put down the time it's still up right now at least we saw it a little bit ago and we took Wally out well, the sky's going to get better for viewing in the next few weeks and the <clears throat> next couple of weeks. So how about the seven sisters, your Pleiades? So this is this is Tuesday night about three o'clock in the afternoon, okay. 3 a.m. Okay. It becomes first or last quarter phase here. Mm -hmm. this, this is the time when you can see the most detail in the center part of the moon in here. These three craters, uh, what is it, Ptolemy, Alphonsus, and Aristophanes or something like that um, are very vivid, very nice craters. You know, tightly locked moon. Yep. If it were really off kilter as far as, I mean, it had a lopsided elliptical orbit, with the, there's no way you could get tidally locked. Uh, actually, it? it's it's slightly elliptical. That doesn't preclude an elliptic uh, being tidally locked. Wonder That's why we see 60% of it. Mm -hmm. We occasionally see the uh, other side, a little part of it, a crescent, you suppose, up here? We see, we see around the edges and around the top and bottom. That's pretty much what I ask. It's called libration. 
Is it Mercury on a slight uh, elliptical? And it's tidally locked, isn't it? It's in a resonance. It's in a resonance? That's what yes. it's called? It's not simply tidally locked. Oh, yeah. okay. So it... here's, here's what Mercury looks like. Um, ah, speak of the devil. In, uh, and well, that, Jerry, it's, it's a really nice time to see Mercury in the western sky after the sun goes down. Um, I think on the 9th, Mercury is the furthest from the sun on this particular uh, travel. Uh, it's pretty easy to see. It's kind of underneath, as you look west and south of west, it's underneath the triangle of the lion. Okay, that's, that's where I saw it uh, last night anyway. It's pretty weak and pretty tough to pull out, to be honest, because I think maybe the ecliptic is, is shallow. Is yeah. that right, Chuck? It's yeah. kind of shallow. So Mercury is very near, and this week will be at its greatest eastern elongation, which means mm -hmm. it's farthest from the sun in the sky. So we don't give it the same phases as our moon. Uh, we don't say, here's a new Mercury or fourth you can phase. You can if you want, because the same phases occur there. Yeah, yeah. Except our moon never goes around the other side of the sun. It's always with us. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's but it has similarities. Here's a large Tycho light crater on, Mer on Mercury, and it has rays spinning out from this. The difference, the main difference between the moon and Mercury, of course, is because one's a moon, one's a planet. But the moon is made out of the same material that the Earth's crust is made out of. It's a lighter weight material with a smaller core. Mercury is more like it's mostly all core. It's very heavy, very hard. Um, and very little crust and mantle. But but it's so hot there that you'll notice the craters all look pretty shallow. Uh, it's like it's mushy because it's it's so hot. Really? But not lava hot? Not lava hot, but, you know, 700 the heat, degrees. The heat king of our uh, solar system is, of course, Venus. Venus, yeah. Which yeah, right. Lead on the surface. For different reasons, though. <laughs> with an atmosphere, but probably look just like this. Okay, where are we now? Ah, we're heading out into the this gas. Is at this time, which is tomorrow night at midnight. Um, or is the, that tonight uh, at midnight? <laughs> you're right, tonight at midnight. The uh, great red spot is centered in the disk. All the rest of the moon's Io is the closest here at this scale. All the rest of the moons are scattered out of the field of view here. But seeing yeah, the great, great red spot, and you can watch it go across because Mercury or Jupiter rotates once every 10 hours. So if you go across here is five hours, and to see it go from here to about here is like one or two hours or one hour. So you can actually see motion on Jupiter if you sit and look at it. Uh, and Jupiter for us is coming up just ahead of one o'clock in the morning. Well, at 10 hours, it'll go by twice before midnight, maybe, wouldn't you think? Or at least once. Yeah, but during the day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You can't see it during the day. You're right. So 10 hours later, this is midnight. 10 hours later would be 10 a.m. And it would look like this again at 10 a.m. Except okay. that this wouldn't be black. <laughs> 2 p.m. is middle of the day, but that's 10 hours earlier, and that's uh, a little less than three hours from now. <laughs> it's out there. Interesting. Okay. Okay. It's our concave horizon again. Yes. This is looking in the east. This is stuff that's rising. The moon mm -hmm. is past full. It's approaching um, its, at its last quarter this week and then it'll be new next week dark time jupiter is here what time did this this is 4 a.m august 9 so wednesday at 4 a.m wednesday morning uh, the moon is now working its way across the pleiades which is hard to see because the planetary software has named all the stars in the pleiades here <laughs> seven of them seven sisters Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ah. Usually the parents are included too. So oh, you, yeah, you can see um you can see the star, um, the cluster 
with seven in it by your naked eye. With and good one vision. Of, one of the six little stars that form what I used to call the Little Dipper. That's not the Little Dipper, but it's not. Yeah, the this, no, this is the Micro Dipper. Oh, I got you. Okay, this is it, the one I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot going on at this time in the morning. This comet Enki is here. Jupiter is up. Uranus is up. And these red things are asteroids. Four oh. Vesta and five Astrea. Not Eumonia? No. Eumonia is up. It's a little different. Pneumonia is 15. Okay, well, it was in your talking points, and I'd never heard of it. 15 pneumonia, as opposed to the other 14 pneumonias? No, no. <laughs> it's the 15th asteroid for which they got an orbit. Oh, okay. It's not a dwarf planet, though. It's not a no. perfect... No, it's, it's not round. Oh, okay. And so we're not looking at Sagittarius, where pneumonia is. It's eunomia. Uh, yeah. Right. This is a close up of the closer up of the, but this is still a wide field. Most telescopes will not give you this much field of view because they they magnify just too much. This is a gigantic uh, star cluster, and it does have this um, dipper and handle appearance. That's, to the, that's naked, the one I was talking about. To the naked eye. I'll be damned. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff. And huh? you see that little line of stars coming out at like the four o'clock position. That's called Allie's Braid because it seems to come from the star Alcyone. Allie's Braid? Yeah. <laughs> are, are they close to each other or just different places in the sky that happen to line them up in our eyes? No, they're, they're in a cluster. So they're relatively close to each other. And a cool thing is they're roughly 400 light years away from us, maybe a little less. So you're sort of looking at light that left when Galileo was looking at the sky. <laughs> now you can see a little blue haze here. There is a, a longer expanse out here a bit too in there. There is a nebulosity associated with the cluster, but it's not at the same distance as the stars. It's passing in front of the cluster, I believe. Yeah, and it appears blue as a reflection nebula. Yeah. Yeah, it's not being excited and emitting its own light. You know, NASA has proclaimed they've found 500 X or 5,000 exoplanets out there. Are they named the different stars? Do they put them? Any of those that we were just looking at, they know that this one has three, a couple of glass gi uh, gas giants, and this one has two, and this has a bunch of them. Do they know which stars have the exoplanets? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's not added these days, is it? There's just too much to add. Yeah, it would be pretty busy. Pretty messy up there in the sky here. Still. Interesting. Okay, now we're at sunset. Yeah, this is, yeah, there's Mercury. This is about 8 o'clock, mm -hmm. which is a little darker than 8 o'clock a month ago. This is the sun is set. Mm -hmm. Mars in the evening sky. Mercury. Mars is uh, going down. Mercury is at about, it's close to its maximum greatest mm -hmm. elongation. So it's going to go up a little bit and then it's going to go back right. relative to the sun. Yeah. So it won't catch Mars. You know, no. it's going to run away. It's going to run away. Yeah. Why don't we move Star Party this Saturday night to Tom Whittemore's house? <laughs> <laughs> Wally wouldn't enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. Saturday, Wally had two friends show up, Emma and Holly, and they just played and played and played. Yeah. We go with red lights everywhere at the museum. Mm -hmm. Low power red lights. Okay, where, where are we now? Another this is about eight, eight o'clock at night. This shows um, the um, constellation of Sagittarius, the teapot. Uh -huh. There's the body of the teapot, yep. the handle. Short and <laughs> stout. Here is my handle. Stout. Here is my spout. And this in the bullseye is the largest S class. Um, largest what? Asteroid up there called 15 Eunomia. Ah, I didn't get the M in the end reversed. It has not been photographed close enough up to see it, 
but as it rotates up there, uh, you can you can spot the you can see the light uh, reflection off of it change magnitude, and from that they infer the different shapes and sizes. So it gives a very rough idea what it is. It's a long, uh, long, um, almost potato shaped asteroid, as I understand it. But Chuck can give us more insight on that. Yeah, this one in back in May had an occultation. And it was an interesting or a harder one than normal to get because um, the asteroid was actually brighter than the star it was occulting. And so it was a real low magnitude drop. Um, so let's see if I can uh, share screen here. Oh, uh, yeah. Is it all right if I share screen? Let's yeah, see. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this is the light curve I got. So it's noisy because it was such a um, such a small drop in the. It was like a one percent drop in the light. Um, but you can see where the red is where it kind of disappeared, and the the green is where it appeared again, where the star came out from behind the asteroid. And then, um, if we look, how do I get this back? So on the right or on the left, um, the light you see is the star plus the asteroid. And in yes. the middle, you, you just see the asteroid. And then on the right, you see the star plus the asteroid again. These are occultations, everyone yeah. has dots? Yeah. And then um, here is, here is showing it, like Jerry said, the light curve model of the asteroid shape. It's called a dammit model in this case. Um, and you oh. can see kind of uh, where, I don't know if it's centered in the screen there, but you can see um, where the different chords were for the, for the four groups of people who, who tried to observe it here. My chord is the purple one at the bottom, which doesn't <laughs> fit the shape model as well as the others. But uh, I was just using a four inch scope. So you can see my error bars kind of come up closer to the to the edge there. These other guys were using bigger scopes. Is this 15 you know me and we're looking at? Yes. A, a shape model for it. Yeah. Well, I got a potato so, shaped exactly like that in my CRISPR right now. Yeah. What does the dotted line mean? That guy missed it completely, but he should have seen it. No, the dotted line is the predicted center line of the event. Oh, okay. And oh. and then um, you know, the the blue line and the red line jutting out of it those that's what they think the rotational axis is okay wow so it was kind of end on to us with the elongated shape wasn't obvious from this uh, occultation no and then uh let's see here's here's where the people were that were absorbing it uh, observing it i don't know does that show or let's try yeah, yeah. okay here we go So oh. this is where the people were that were observing it. Okay. So the center line was north of us, but we were still predicted to be in the shadow path. And you got it. And it, and we were. So it was a. They had a pretty good handle on its orbit. Of course, it's a bright asteroid. It's you run earlier. You were asking what does S class mean? S class means silicate. So it's it's the biggest rocky asteroid in the asteroid belt. But on this map, Chuck, uh, your letter C of meaning Chuck is over a, a green dot. Is that Santa Barbara? The green dot is where I was, and the green signifies that it was a positive okay, on the occultation. Okay. Wow. So anyway, that was fun. <laughs> Excellent. You can kick me off now. Let's, let's <laughs> stop share. There we go. Well, anytime you post uh, the location in space of an asteroid, you, you can almost imagine a belt at that point, wouldn't that we can't see like we see the uh, on edge view of the galaxy itself. You know, we can't see that those jillions of rocks, can we? That's the belt. It's almost yeah. like another. It's part of the ecliptic of the solar system, isn't it? A lot of them are in the ecliptic, but some of them are, are have uh, orbits that are inclined more. Okay, this one be would be right in the middle of it. Could we draw an imaginary? 
it's it's yeah it's in the mid asteroid belt it was about two au away uh, at the point when that occultation occurred because as many rocks as are out there they're still what millions of miles apart <laughs> yep wow <laughs> space is spacey it's not how they depict it in star wars yep yeah that's why they call it space <laughs> <laughs> all right so this is, again, Eunomia 15 Eunomia, and right in here is M22, the globular cluster that um, Tom was referring to earlier. So they're within a few degrees or about a degree from each other. So the way you look for this, you put your scope where it should be, and the, the coordinates are actually given uh, online. You can look up the asteroid's actual position and right ascension and declination. And you can go there. You want to take a picture or a draw, make a drawing of the star patterns you see, and then look several hours or a day later and see what's moved. And whatever moved, that was the asteroid. If it moved and it has a faint fuzz around it, then you discovered a comet. Well, can an asteroid occult a star cluster? It can go through it, yeah. But not wink out all the stars that are gathered. You'll see some of them around the edge of it as it goes just just whatever ones it covers yeah yeah interesting it depends how close the asteroid is to earth well why are there concentric red circles what does that mean that's just the size of my per cursor on this uh, planetarium software you know you know ron you see some people on their scopes they have the little uh one power finder okay and it projects it's like a little head-up display system and it projects this circular pattern onto the sky to help you find stuff when you're pointing your telescope and the little circles are like half a degree one degree and three degrees or something like that yeah to help and you so, navigate so you know me would be in the center of that target right yes yeah but it looks like one of the stars is sitting there in the outside like an orbit that's m22 the globular cluster oh M oh it's what it's okay that's not that's a star m22 oh. right there got it okay i can now catch up with you thank you amazing Teapot. Teapot is not a constellation. It's an asterism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, M28 is also a nice one, nice popular. And if you I have a Dobsonian, if you've got a Dobsonian, you are looking at M22, and you just slide it to the right, you pick up 28. It's kind mm -hmm. of neat. The laser this area is loaded with excellent objects. Yeah. Right fit nebula, the lagoon nebula. Uh, Swan or the, the Omega Nebula. I call it the two nebula. But anyway. Um, Those are all Tom, uh, Tim Crawford favorites. <laughs> yes. You can star hop across here. You can point your telescope. Oh, he's very, he's very good. I was impressed working with him at Westmont a couple of Fridays ago. Huh. He's actively commenting here, but he's kind of, you know, because of the delay in YouTube, he's kind of 20 seconds behind. So. We, we've kind of passed by a lot of his comments. <laughs> we can go. We can go back. What does he want? Sure. Oh, he's just men mentioned that that one third crater on the moon was Arzakel, and um, mm -hmm. you know that it started to get darker earlier, like you actually did mention right after he made the comment. So, and he says that was a Telrad circle, you know, for the finder. Yeah. yeah. So okay. this is the orbit of Eunomia. It's in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It's slightly elliptical, so it's not a near-Earth object. But it is in a chaotic orbit that, that will eventually, you know, change quite a bit. Yeah, it's not at one of the L points, Lagrange points. Okay. Okay. Now, this is something that's been getting a lot of attention lately. Uh -huh. This is Comet 12P Hans Brooks. As a and July. they're normally just a, a, a nucleus with a coma around it and sometimes a tail. This one a few days ago um, had some kind of, they refer to it, different people refer to it as a volcanic eruption, but it had some kind of event where all of a sudden something just spewed stuff out and it gives this two horned effect to the, the comet. Interesting and, pattern. And people were comparing it to the Millennium Falcon. Yes, that's right. It looks like the spaceship from the Star Wars movie. Wow. And the big difference, of course, is uh, the water vapor, right? The ice that 
hits the sunlight, comes it's in. It's ice and dry ice and ammonia ice, uh, all sorts of things. They never run out. There's always enough there. Oh, yeah, they, they run, run out. out when they when they run out. They become an asteroid. Okay, <laughs> that was going to be my next question. Believe it or not. Whoa, I love this puzzle. Try to get out of there, Waldo. <laughs> this is a very large star map of the constellations. What is that? This is 2023. It's the path of 15 Eunomia. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It's, is this Eunomia? This is the comet, isn't it? This is, oh, excuse me. Yes, the comet. Yeah, 12P 12, 12 Pons Brook. Thank you. Well, what does that hook represent? I backed my brain up for um, Tim, and I forgot to forward, fast forward. <laughs> Ron, Ron, that's like a retrograde loop. That's because of the orbit of the Earth. Right. Oh, okay. But now that comet and the other one uh, are coming out or going in. Can can you say that about comets? They're either coming in or going out. In one way or the other, they're going to pass us somewhere, right? Yeah. I believe this one's coming in. Yeah, because the spaces are getting farther apart, meaning it's closer to us as it goes around. Yeah. And the other one's called Atlas, right? C2023. Yes, we'll okay. So the dates here, this is July 20. This is uh, August 9. Uh, at this Which point, this, this point, yeah. So this so is about Draco. Where, right. And this this pattern is Draco. Um, next year, it will be 11. This is, um, there we are. We changed to 2024. And then we go down here through the constellations. And you're going to get this position. You're going to get this view during next year's to 2024 eclipse of the sun. And during oh. the eclipse, you can see 12P, Pons, Brooks, uh, Uranus, Jupiter, and Mercury close to the sun. It's a good opportunity to see Mercury. Um, but don't, don't forget you need a sun filter, uh, not for this part of the phase, but you gotta have your filter on just before this, take it off during this, and it lasts about uh, two or three minutes, I think four minutes, and then you put your sun filter right back on. The solar eclipse. Tom Whittemore, yeah. are you going to try to find that uh, comet? The comet, probably not. The eclipse, uh, it's going right over my hometown, Indianapolis. And so we've been talking about, you know, seeing family, mem family members. Yeah, but we get to see the old corona or the hot corona that's never really visible when it's fully lit and not covered over. Yep. The sun. Hmm. Hans Brooks. We know the names of the two guys that discovered it, don't we? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And it's a good photo object, even at this stage, a year before this event. Uh, wow. These A lot of these things, there's even a couple pictures I saw on the internet that showed the detailed horns of it um, taken with a uh, EV scope. Huh. Okay, so small aperture. Yeah, yeah, four inch aperture. This is what the next comet Atlas looks like. Ah, uh -huh. and this is more typical. The reason they're this looks the way the stars are moving because they took subframes at different points and the the comet moved, but they tracked the comet. So um, stars move. This has a nucleus, the coma, and then a slight tail going up this way. Light tail. Slight. You can just pick out the haze of it. I've always heard that they not only have one tail going straight away from the sun, they got another one going slightly a different direction. There's two tails. They can have three tails. Three tails. <laughs> but you get what you get, I guess, with comets. Yep. Hmm. So this comet is also in the north. Here it is in June, July, July. It's speeding up. It's coming in. Here we are at August 5th and August 10th. So we're about right here in the lower reaches of Cephas, Cepheus. Hmm. Old man Haley, he discovered his comet. Is that the only one he ever discovered? Is he a viable? He didn't, dis he didn't discover it, Ron. He just calculated the orbit. After somebody else discovered it. It had been, it had been known yeah. since ancient times. <laughs> But they, he, didn't have, they didn't have an earlier name for it? Well, no, they, they didn't know that it was the same comet. 
Oh, but it'd been seen multiple times. He's the one that kind of connected the observations and said, hey, wait a minute, this is the same thing. But Halley was a viable astronomer of his time, just like Messier was, right? Yes. Or Herschel or any of those guys. Yeah. Okay. What is this? My God. This is an artist rendition of a small star bursting with activity, including okay. sunspots, flares caused by magnetic fields. So the point of this was there's a study that was published in um, Physics Letters um, that discussed, they studied stars in, I don't know if you guys will recognize this or not, but the, was <laughs> cluster, but uh, in, they studied small stars in the beehive cluster and uh, the, a number of them have, and they, they were looking specifically at the magnetic fields around them. And they found that with looking at 136 stars, that they, these are about 600 light years from Earth, <clears throat> they have um, unusually strong magnetic fields. The assumption has been modeled on the basically that the sun is a general case. The sun rotates with a differential rotation because it's a almost a fluid. It's a plasma magnetohydrodynamic fluid. The equator rotates faster than the poles do. And so there's a slight, and that gives a lot of twisting up of the um, magnetic fields and causes these eruptions as, as fields break and reconnect. But these smaller stars show much more activity than the sun does. And they've decided, <clears throat> they propose, yeah, the astrophysical letter, journal letters. The, um, <clears throat> they propose that this star, that these stars rotate, the shell, the outer part rotates at a different speed than the core. And this produces a lot more activity of the magnetic field, a lot more breaking and reconnecting, which, which releases energy. And these stars um, are producing a lot more flares and sunspots. And the environment around them through modeling is believed to be uh, way too radiation rich for any kind of uh, even basic life to exist, such as um, um, bacteria and stuff. Well, it's not like we've discovered life anywhere else. So we haven't seen it, found it anywhere. <laughs> so it really kind of doesn't matter, Mr. President, that but at least we can knock these out of contention, right? We're not going to get our alien contacts from any of these stars. And yet the sun, doesn't different latitudes of our sun go at different rotation speeds? Doesn't that's it? That's true, but that's, not, but that's not, uh, that's an angular speed on the outside on the surface. The uh, These stars, the core breaks loose from the magnetic field of the uh, surface region. And then they uh, run independently each other, and then they a couple rotations, then they link back up. Each of these breaks and links produces uh, energy explosions that throw material out of the star. Our star does not, it rotates at different speeds across the surface, but not in depth. Oh. But our sun does have flares and prominences and occasions. Yes, we do, and CMEs. Yeah. It's not as bad. Wow. Are they all together? Or is this like a star cluster we're looking at? This is the Beehive, Beehive star cluster. And they it looked is. at 136 of the stars in this cluster. And they're all similar like that. Mm -hmm. The way you uh, decide on um, magnetic fields is by looking at these stars in polarized light. Is it part of the Drake equation? This one of the terms of the Drake equation for these stars just dropped way down in probability. Oh, okay. So they may have found planets, exoplanets orbiting some of these stars, but God help us if there's any life there, they got to be immune to radiation, I guess. Yes. Wow. And the Earth had a real problem with radiation when it was young. And we, it couldn't have, we couldn't support life on land until an ozone layer formed in our atmosphere and was stable. And that blocked the ultraviolet light that breaks organic molecules. So if there had been surface life on the planet at that time, um, it would have all been radiated to death. 
And then what over the last few years, the old chlorophor, but chlorofluorocarbons have been wiping it out over Antarctica. We have a big hole in our over Australia. Is We've it Australia? Pretty much stopped that. It's closing up. Oh, it is. Okay. Wow. But it's definitely going to be a problem for our astronauts on Mars, isn't it? And between Earth and Mars. If not the six month trip there inside a unprotected spaceship. Well, they're going to protect it, you know, of course. Yeah, as best they I, can. I heard that putting the water that they drink around them in a, you know, a circular tubular tank would help them. Is there something yes. to that? It's a good radiation shield. Is that right? <laughs> this is fascinating stuff, but boy, it just ate up all the time, didn't it? I love this stuff, man. I learned so much. Can't wait for the big test. I feel like I'm getting an incredible astronomy course out at university and not paying a dime for it. Well, I, the Perseids, well didn't you get our invoice? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Perseids peak on Sunday morning this weekend, this coming weekend. Yeah, 1 a.m. Perseus, uh, a meteor shower? Yeah, it's a, it's one of the best showers of the year. Yeah. And what day did you say, Saturday? Saturday night, Sunday morning. So 1 a.m. Sunday. But not a, not early enough to be part of our star party. Oh. Which Well, there involve... may be some. I mean, it ramps up toward the peak. So we may see some at the star party. Yeah, I'm sure I saw a straggler uh, Saturday night. Yeah. Well, if you can use my help, I'm going to be there anyway, regardless. I'll bring my little folding chair and everybody's invited and it's free. And uh, doggone, we get hundreds of people at those star parties. It's amazing. Yeah. You put in such a lot of work with that five pound. That is a five pound meteorite you pass around, isn't it, Chuck? Yep. And what's <laughs> happening in between real quick that you can do? Uh, Thursday night is Bacara and Friday night is Refugio State Beach. And then Saturday night is the museum. Okay, gentlemen, we did good on Friday night. I hope it continues. Tom, take care of your wife, Maureen, and Chuck, you and Pat. I guess we're going to be saying goodbye to you in a few weeks, but uh, send me something. Bring me back a pub hat. <laughs> and and Jerry, thank you for, your, for running webmaster duties, and we'll see you all next week for the SBAU Astro Hour number 130 for the Astronomical Unit of Santa Barbara. Take care, everybody. Appreciate Bye. It.